Hello everyone, welcome to another Wednesday video and if you haven't already guessed from the video title, today we're going to be going into a little bit more detail as to why some things exploded. Now of course <laughs> in naval warfare, especially 20th century naval warfare, the general aim is to make the other side explode, hopefully not yourself, but um, as we all know there were some unfortunate tendencies where things exploded that weren't supposed to explode. And we're not talking about just Jutland. Um, there were a number of rather spectacular and embarrassing magazine explosions across a lot of different navies, actually, but primarily in the early 20th century in the French and British navies. And, you know, that obviously the magazine got detonated. That, that's a fairly easy way, way of summarizing it. But why? were French and British explosives detonating spontaneously and when they, that wasn't desired as compared to, uh, so let's say, German explosives where the Kriegsmarine and the Kaiserliche Marine really didn't tend to suffer from unwanted magazine detonations. Well, to do that, we've brought over uh, Matthew here on... Which way around am I going? This way? This way? Yes, that way. <laughs> He's over there. Um, <laughs> and uh, so perhaps you'd like to give yourself a bit of an introduction. Well, thanks for having me on. Yes, my name's Matthew. I'm currently doing my PhD in physics, but I also have a background in chemistry, which is hence why I'm here. I, I love my history, but I haven't majored in it. And I've been looking for a way to try and add my bit of knowledge to the history side of things. And I was curious about this topic. And after chatting with you about it, it looks like we would probably be able to combine our skills and hopefully figure out at least plausible explanations for what happened. And after the research I've done, I think we've got a good idea of why it was particularly dangerous in these ships and what set their magazines off. Yep. So um, I suppose the first thing to briefly mention is that, you know, these explosives are not all created equal. All of these navies are using different explosives. Everyone started in the late 19th century from the same base of using black powder, which everyone was thoroughly paranoid about because by that point, you'd had three, 400 years of experience of what happens if you leave even the smallest amount of black powder out and the spark sets off. Um, things just tend to escalate rather dramatically. But um, towards the end of the 19th century, as they were looking for longer range uh, firepower and metallurgy allowed them to extend the barrel length of their guns beyond the sort of 25 30 35 caliber weapons that they had up till that point they also needed a different forms of explosive and different navies started researching and they came up with a whole variety of different explosives which they would adopt um, but we're going to i guess cover what, what did the the ones that had the issues eventually the french and the british actually end up adopting yes yeah, so the the base here is that when you're making an explosive, there are two things from a chemistry point of view that you want to consider. And, well, one of them is entropy and the other one is enthalpy. So it's basically how how much gas expansion you get from entropy and that enthalpy is just the energy. And you can have a really good explosive that is not suitable for use in a Navy. And the two that seem to be the dangerous ones to adopt or at least the first one was gun cotton or nitrocellulose so you basically take regular cotton and you switch out one of the groups and put a nitrate there nitrates are really good in explosives they tend to not only give you a lot of entropy but a lot of enthalpy but it's not the most stable of things and one of the other problems with it is not not only does it burn way too well but it also produces water. So you tend to wear out gun barrels a lot, lot faster than you would expect. So that was something they figured out pretty quickly. So they went for another mix. And so most of the navies tended to use some version of that mix, or at least the ones with problems. So the British went for cordite, which was a mix of nitrocellulose, nitroglycerin and then generally petroleum ge jelly as a stabilizing agent which is basically vaseline the french didn't even use the nitroglycerin that was basically nitrocellulose and like just solid kind of the cotton form of it then a um like a gelatin mix of it uh it was uh, like a i'm not entirely sure how to describe it beyond that but it was still nitroglycerin just 
done in a different form. And then maybe a very, very small percent of a stabilizing agent, generally a petroleum jelly, similar to the British. And those tended to make for good explosives. They didn't burn as fast as nitrocellulose on its own did. Nitroglycerin itself is a liquid, so you definitely don't want that in your ship. And it makes it harder to load, I imagine. Mm -hmm. But the cordite or the white powder that the French version was had a few other problems that uh, was what kind of let them to be so dangerous. But those are the the two main ones mm -hmm. that that were there. Yeah, and it's, it bears it bears mentioning at this point two things. One is, of course, we're not going to tell you how to make cordite <laughs> or poudre B or any of these other things. Um, so yeah, if you've come here looking for that, you'd probably switch off now. It's a bad idea. We we don't want to get sued <laughs> um, uh, or worse. But secondly, um, we have to differentiate at this point. You know, in chemistry, there is low order explosives and high order explosives. Um, and yes, things like dynamite had been invented by this point. Uh, dynamite is obviously a, a high explosive, but dynamite and it, other related things, um, these days, things like C4, are thoroughly, thoroughly unsuitable for propellants because of, like you mentioned, they burn far, far too fast. So you end up with a point, basically a point detonation, a huge shock wave. And to put it crudely, no pushing force. There's just a shock wave which tends to shatter everything around it, including the gun barrel, at which point you've just made a very, very expensive pipe bomb um, and nothing's gone the enemy's way apart from a few fragments. Whereas as, the, as you step down through the burn rate and the gas expansion rate starts to be a little bit lower as well, you can get a continuous push. And that's what actually is better for um, naval guns, because obviously if you have a long barrel naval gun, you want that expansion of gas to push the shell out continuously, accelerating until it reaches the end of the barrel without putting so much stress on it that, you know, that either the pressure builds up too quickly and the gun explodes, or that if it burns too slowly, because there is a balance to this, if it burns too slowly, then the expansion rate will start to slow down and the shell will actually slow down and then it has all sorts of weird aerodynamic effects once it leaves but the, this is why they have they can't just go what makes the biggest bang <laughs> and stick that in a gun barrel which is also partly why i brought up those two aspects to look at it's because yes that makes a good explosive but there are so many other things to it as i mentioned gun cotton does produce water when it burns amongst mm -hmm. other things obviously but yeah, that burn rate is really important. And it turns out, I at least from research I've done, that getting that burn rate right may have actually really, really hurt the, the British, particularly at Jutland, which is, I think, the best case study for some of these dangerous ones. But I do want to mention a little bit of the manufacturing process. Mm -hmm. I am definitely not going to give enough so someone can actually repeat these. So I am deliberately leaving this a little more vague, but I do need to mention a few things. Mm -hmm. Nitroglycerin nitro, uh, and, cell, and nitrocellulose are made in a similar manner, or at least chemically similar. The manufacturing, the actual physical process does vary a fair bit, and there's so many extra steps to go from that to getting the cordite mix. But you basically take your starting product and you mix it with nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Definitely not saying what ratio of those that is important because the sulfuric acid also came back to bite the British or bite the, particularly the British. And I reckon it was what did the French, some of the French ships in particularly spontaneous detonations later, but I'll, we'll come back to that. So you do need very strong acids in the manufacturing process and you get left with these solid, they're, they're well, more like a giant cotton block of lots of rods, the, the cordite, uh, it's it's a weird looking one, but one of the things that was interesting is that nitroglycerin is way, way more volatile, well, not volatile, but more dangerous than black powder in that it goes off a lot easier. Gun cotton is not a lot further behind. And so the manufacturing of both of them was considered very dangerous. But one of the papers I found from 1899 actually said 
no, that's not the case. It said, yes, the process is incredibly dangerous and nitroglycerin is not as, you know, is unstable, but the process is not as dangerous because it doesn't have the dust that you get left over from black powder, which is, as you mentioned, the propellant everyone was using basically before they, they moved into this era that at least for the British ended up with cordite and for the French ended up with their white powder, which was apparently actually grey. And one of the things is that originally the British had a mix where they had that nitroglycerin, nitrocellulose, and then the stabilizing agent, but it burned too quickly. Still, it And it was actually wearing out the gun barrels really, really fast. So they changed the ratio of the nitroglycerin uh, glycerin and night and gun cotton without actually properly understanding or at least it looks like they didn't quite understand one of the potential side effects that comes from that and that when you have uh cordite stored it doesn't stay stable for very long after a while it starts to de- starts to degrade and the mk1 the first version didn't seem to have this problem but the second one the modified version over time formed very very small nitroglycerin crystals on the outside of the cordite charges which would break away and form this fine layer of dust everywhere which is already a problem yeah and this this was actually recognized as a problem on at least one british ship because there's a record of uh, Gunner Grant, who was in charge of HMS Lions Gunnery, um, came into the ship uh, shortly before Jutland. And because everyone had had this idea that cordite was really stable, much less volatile, et cetera, et cetera, than black powder was, at least in terms of magazine storage, um, obviously not realizing what was going on, um, con- cleanliness had slipped. Um, so in a black powder magazine, if you're, say, on HMS Victory or HMS Warrior, um, Everyone was scrupulous about there must be absolutely no black powder anywhere but in the bags that we want it to be in. Um, And then uh, Officer Grant shows up and he finds dust everywhere in Lions Magazine, in the handling rooms, et cetera, et cetera. And he's trying to get people, you know, you need to tidy this up. You need to keep it clean. And some of the officers are like, "But, but why? It's not a hazard. And so he sweeps it all up, puts a row of it, a line of it out on deck and sets fire to one end and of course it being a mixture of regular dust and nitroglycerin p- powder it just goes and everyone's like ah yeah may- maybe maybe we should actually tidy that <laughs> from now on which may well be the reason why um then subsequently at jutland lion didn't explode even though q turret took a fairly b- big hit as compared to some of the other ships like uh, queen mary and indefatigable but we'll we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, a little bit more later as we go along. So yeah, nitroglycerin dust not a not a good thing. No. So the, even at the time, it was understood that one of the things that made it safer was the fact that it didn't have dust. But yet they were getting dust from it. But it didn't seem to be a side effect they knew of. And the likely culprit from the studies I can I can do on it because you know in hindsight is very different from what they knew at the time is that uh, it was actually a lack of proper process control and quality control in the manufacturing. This is why I mentioned those acids that looks like they were leaving behind fairly good quantities of sulfuric acid, which also I think probably came back to bite the French, Mm. is that when you have those acids left over, not only does it degrade the the petroleum jelly they've put in to do the stabilizing over time, because it's an organic compound it will slowly react with something as nasty as sulfuric acid but it also uh, over time helps degrade the actual chemi- like the actual explosives themselves so they become more and more dangerous i'll come back to that one a little more for the french because mm-hmm. i don't think that was uh, as big of a problem for the british i think the dust being everywhere was the big problem because Another thing to consider with these explosives is not only do you have these dangerous dust being formed, but it's also the nature of the explosive themselves. When you have something like nitroglycerin, nitrocellulose, and black powder, they are the sort of explosives that if they get a single spark or if there is flame, they will detonate. 
they just there is nothing you can do once the flame reaches your store. Other explosives, more modern example being things like Semtex and C4, don't do that. You can actually burn C4. And I, I remember from uh, days in cadets, they used to give us these little wax covered tablets for, for cooking and you would set them on fire, but they're basically a byproduct of making uh, one of the various plastic explosives. Uh, I'm going to, to yeah. keep some of the details <laughs> somewhat sparse here, but you could set them on fire. There was no, no danger, but not nitroglycerin or nitrocellulose. Mm. So any flame or any shock was not probably enough to put you at risk of a detonation because that's the other thing with particularly nitroglycerin is that changes in pressure as well as changes in temperature and sparks are enough to cause a detonation. And when you're talking about a confined metal container that these ships basically were, that means that if you have this dust everywhere and then you have a shock wave come through, you don't need a flame to get inside. You don't need fire to reach, uh, even as probably far as the magazine. You mm. just need some of that shock wave to, and then you're going to have the, even if your charges themselves are stable enough not to go off with that, the dust does. And then once you get that fire, once it reaches the cordite, there, there's little you can do. You're going to have an explosion. Yeah, I mean, that brings up two things to mind. One is um, in some of the bigger carrier fires, so Franklin and Bunker Hill in World War II and Forrestal um, in the early part of the Cold War, there are multiple accounts of people seeing um, sort of the fires engulf the flight deck. There's aircraft loaded with ammunition. Um, some of the ammunition, machine gun ammunition especially, is going off. But you know, people are watching whole rivers of liquid explosive pour out of bombs and torpedoes because they're this, as you said, they're this slightly more modern explosive that will, would sooner melt and just burn rather than explode. And when you do get some of these major explosions um, during those fires, it tends to be more often than not either fuel tanks or potentially the detonators, which are obviously made of a somewhat more sensitive and volatile explosive as opposed to the main block of explosive that's in the warhead. Um, which is is it's just it's a thoroughly bizarre thing to read about unless you fully understand the physics of it of like you know someone watching a thousand pound bomb with liter upon liter upon liter of liquid explosive just running over the flight deck but not exploding um and you know the the other thing is which is what you were mentioning about the shockwave this as we were discussing just before before we start the recording this has actually led me to revise somewhat my estimations as to what might have happened on at some of the British battle cruisers at Jutland, because as we said, you know, the Gordite is gradually exuding these nitroglycerin dust crystals. And it's not something that if you've got your know, Cordite, you know, day one fresh out of the, the manufacturing area, it's not doing it. Week one, maybe not, month one, maybe even not. Maybe even by year one you might notice a little bit, but not a tremendous amount it's something that's going to happen over time so when you're initially doing your trials to adopt cordite you're going to look at it and go well it's, it's obviously there's no problem it's something that comes about only with years and years and years of having the stuff around um but yeah so what i realized was that you have the battle cruiser fleet and they are exercising their guns they're drilling constantly so they're bringing charges and exercise shells up out of the magazines putting them in the guns taking them out of the guns and then sending the charges back down again into the magazines for for storage for actual use later on now of course there's endless debate about was the magazine doors open possibly yes possibly no depending on the ship was anti-flash protection removed again possibly yes possibly no depending on the ship um were there charges being stored in either the gun gun house itself, which we would call the turret, or in the handling room immediately below the turret. Again, possibly yes, possibly no. There's evidence one way, both ways, depending on which ship the account is coming from. But actually, it seems like it probably would actually could be irrelevant in some ways. I mean, obviously, if you have a stack of cordite in your turret and it gets hit, that's bad news. But... If all of these cordite charges are exuding nitroglycerin dust crystals, then every time you run a drill, 
and those charges come up you open the case you take the charge out you slam it into the gun you take it out the gun put it back you're now shedding dust into the turret and then if you don't clean that up and tidy it or if you you know sweep the open areas but it's building up in nooks and crannies and trust me if you've ever been inside a battleship gun turret there's plenty of nooks and crannies for this stuff to accumulate in you're going to end up with a turret that's full of nitroglycerin in dust form um which is not good news and then if a shell comes in and smacks into the turret you know worst case scenario it hits the turret shockwave transmits through the metal that shockwave that goes into into the turret is going to immediately you know anything that's loose that's on the floor is going to jump up into the air so you're going to get aerosolized <laughs> nitroglycerin dust um basically a fuel there a very very volatile fuel there explosive and then the shell arrives and goes hello bang off goes the nitroglycerin but as you pointed out actually you wouldn't even necessarily need the shell to penetrate just the the shock wave generated by a 11 inch or 12 inch shell slamming into a thick slab of metal at several times the speed of sound would probably in and of itself be enough to set off this nitroglycerin dust and once that happens you basically got a fuel air explosion going on inside the turret that can travel down the the, the hoist into the magazine any dust that's there will be set off any exposed charges that are there will be set off and up goes the ship <laughs> which is obviously not good news and to be fair you know even if you were even if you were scrupulously clean like say on a on lion and you tidied absolutely everywhere on on the turret after drill it may not matter because in the context of jutland by the time any of the British ships have blown up, they fired multiple salvos at their opponents. So even if they're following all the anti-flash precautions, even if they're not storing a single charge in the turret, which they may well have been, I mean, it's it's not exactly rocket science for someone to imagine, hey, you know what, let's improve the, our rate of fire going into action here, just start sending some charges up so we've got some reserve, because they do also have shell storage in the um, handling room that's immediately below the turret. So if they can have charges to hand they can get a bunch of shells sent basically one deck level up and have a high rate of fire while they're replenishing that stock from deep in the magazines. But even if they don't do that, even if they're following every possible procedure, every time you open a case to take out a charge and each shell requires multiple charges and there's two guns in each turret, by the time you fired a dozen or more salvos, you'll have just been dumping cordite dust all over, or nitroglycerin dust all over the turret. So that ship could have been spick and span and perfectly clean the day, the, the morning it went into action. But by the time the German shell arrives, you've, you've got a bunch of nitroglycerin dust inside, which in some ways actually makes the fact that more British ships didn't explode <laughs> more the miracle than the fact that three of them did. Well, three battle cruisers, not including um, defense and so forth. Yeah, that's that's the other thing is that you're right once you have that the, those nitroglycerin crystals forming on the outside of the cordite as soon as you try moving them you're going to make that dust and i've worked in enough labs to know that even if you're trying to keep them clean after a while you'll get all sorts of traces of things getting everywhere i one of the the labs where i worked recently had to relocate because they kept they tested positive for large traces of lead <laughs> it may not have been them like chemicals and even chemical dusts can be a lot harder to spot than you think. And nitroglycerin is about an order of magnitude more powerful as an explosive, uh, to define it loosely, mm. than black powder. So not only did you have all that experience they had with black powder, which was not even as explosive, but still, I mean, not something you want going off nearby, but you have this more volatile, this more sensitive dust everywhere and the cordite charges themselves in the magazine you don't need that fire to reach that far even if you have the dust going off in the hoist or the corridor if that shock wave reaches the magazine the cordite itself could go off if you get a single lick of flame on a single charge you're going to lose the magazine because again that was one thing that uh, more modern explosives and uh, i say modern but they were actually like the germans which i'll mention their explosive in a minute 
they they didn't have this problem because their explosives don't do that. They could actually burn without detonating. You need a proper shockwave impact to set them off. Basically, you need a blasting cap or the the firing of a of a gun to do it. You can't you can't do it by a tiny bit of flame or a small change in pressure, which nitroglycerin certainly you can. And there were labs even before then who basically it had accidents where someone had dropped a vial or a container of nitroglycerin and that was enough to lose the lab. One of the highest paid jobs before the invention of dynamite was the transport of nitroglycerin because it was so incredibly dangerous. So even though they, they, you know, you may not have that danger in the cordite alone because it's got sta- you know, some stabilizing agent once that dust is there, you're you're in trouble. And one of the other things too is that they were told that these explosives were safe because technically, in the pure cordite form, as they came fresh out of a factory, they should have been. Uh, one of the papers from I uh, found from 1899 on the manufacture of nitroglycerin says that, uh, to paraphrase, it is a very dangerous procedure, but it's not as bad as black or brown powder because you don't have that dust. So Until later, <laughs> once you have, yeah, once you have that dust, you've kind of reversed that whole thing. Mm. And yeah, I don't think you would, yeah, it would matter if you had all of the procedures in place. If you had a trail of that dust, you could get enough of a shockwave that would probably cause this thing to detonate all the way down. Doesn't quite explain the French one, but it mm. it does explain, I think, why the Germans could take such a pounding and not actually have the same problem. Uh, they were using uh, an explosive or stabilizing. Well, they stabilized it using centralite, which is um, one three diethyl one three diphenyl urea, and that's big fancy name, but. That stabilizing agent, unlike the petroleum jelly that the, the British were doing, was much, much better at doing its job. You could basically light a German magazine on fire and it will not detonate. You need a really solid shockwave. So if you don't have dust forming from it and the shockwave is contained to the turret where you have a much smaller amount of this, and then you're a lot safer. And I think that bears out that the Germans definitely took a much bigger pounding uh, or at least some of their ships did mm. without nearly having the same, I guess, losses the, the British, yeah. unfortunately. Suffered. Well, I mean, at, at Dogger Bank, they have some fairly dodgy ammunition handling practices and uh, Seidlitz's aft, one of Seidlitz's aft turrets gets hit. Um, the fire reaches the magazines, but they manage to flood them. But an awful lot of um, of the charges actually start to burn. But obviously, you say Liz is around for Jutland, she doesn't explode, but there's this towering column of flame that burns out the two aft turrets, um, which is deflagration rather than explosion. It's basically a very, very intense fire um, rather than rather than you know, they're the crossing the threshold into an into an explosion. Um, and after that, they learn. But even so, um, at Jutland, Seidlitz in particular, but a bunch of other German ships as well, do have their turrets knocked out by british shells it does start fires in those turrets and those t- those fires are very intense and quite often the entire turret crew is killed but they remain fires albeit very energetic ones rather than explosions and you see the same thing if you watch the footage of uss arizona exploding at pearl harbor which i did a video on and it sort of explained it there because the u.s had a similar kind of much more stable propellant um in, in their magazine. So although Arizona is blown open by the black powder that's stored there as well going off, um, you can see there's actually two, there's a two stage explosion going on. You've got this initial massive bang, which is quite almost a hundred tons of black powder. That's pretty much does the ship in, but then there's this prolonged, very intense fl- flame that goes on for multiple seconds, as opposed to just the initial bang. And that's most of the stuff in the magazines cooking off. Admittedly, at that point, it's now kind of exposed to the open air, so it's no longer contained. Um, but it's a massive deflagration of the explosive rather than a, te- technically speaking, rather than a detonation, which explains why there's you know a decent chunk of Arizona left for everybody to 
to have as a memorial rather than being scattered across several square miles. Well, that's that's the thing is that as you're mentioning with um with the Germans, yeah, even if you had a fire reach that magazine, eventually you could probably get enough heat and pressure to cause the detonation, but it will take longer. You have time, and as you said, they could flood the magazine in that time. You can get these fires under control. Whereas if you've got something that where the magazine detonates within a second or two of that flame reaching it, nobody can react fast enough. Because if it's blown through, you know, any flash doors you have, or in some cases it may have been if they were actually propping them open and that flash reaches the magazine, it doesn't matter how clued on anyone on that ship was. It's unfortunately too late. Still doesn't explain everything because the French had a few ships go off in harbour. Yeah. The well British weren't exactly uh, <laughs> French were British weren't exactly short of that either. I mean HMS Vanguard detonates in nineteen seventeen alongside Harbour. HMS Natal does the same thing. Um but yeah, the French the, the interesting thing is the British magazine detonations happened during the First World War, so it could be just a mistake and uh, something happening unsafely in the magazines at that point. Um whether that be in direct relation to the explosives themselves or the nitroglycerin dust. But the French, as you mentioned, they seem to have a series of explosions on various ships, including a number of pre-dreadnoughts, well before the First World War. Um, and these are happening spontaneously in peacetime, which and everyone's very confused as to what exactly is going on. So I guess what's, what's the story with Poudre B? <laughs> yes. Uh, so... Poudre B, excuse my pronunciation, mm. white powder. It's not actually white. It's apparently grey. Uh, but that was the one I was mentioning that was basically just done cotton. But it wasn't in the pure cotton form. They took a portion of it and turned it into basically a gelatin mix using, I think, parafilm. Uh, it was, again, I'm being deliberately mm -hmm. ignoring certain details because I'm not telling anyone how to make these explosives because they're already unsafe enough. And so, like the British, they have a stabilizing agent, and they were. And so, the reason they've done it this way is, gun cotton on its own, not suitable for a gun. But if you can slow it down, if you can change the properties a bit, then it can become suitable as a projectile. But I think that the French, probably because the similar thing to the British, the quality control in the manufacturing, I think, is what did it in for them. And this may also explain the British ships as well, and possibly they could suffer from the same. Uh, problems it's a little harder to say what happens with the cordite mix as opposed to uh just gun cotton on its own but even modern gun cotton and cellulose uh, nitrocellulose stocks have been known to detonate one of the things that is key to consider is that nitrocellulose on its own will start to degrade over time and that degradation is exothermic. It will produce heat. And it's a process that will speed up. And you might think, okay, if it's happening a little bit here and there and that heat is over days and days and days, you're not going to get to the 200-odd degrees you need to cause detonation. It's 247 degrees Celsius, if I remember correctly, um, to, to cause um, gun cotton to, to flash. But... Once you get a fire, it's exothermic enough that you'll soon reach that temperature. But I think something else that needs to be considered is that as it degrades, that gets faster. And when you're looking at a mi like microscopic level, I'm talking individual molecules, to get a reaction to occur, you basically need molecules to collide in the right way. When you have a whole stock of explosives in a magazine, that's a hell of a lot of atoms you might have so many of them at X amount of energy on average, but it only takes one molecule somewhere there to reach the right conditions to detonate. And I said, these things keep going. So what happens is you have this degradation over time, this decomposition, which uh, I've read papers that were written since the 2000s, actually, I think within the last five years that have looked at this. So this was something they didn't really understand at the time, though uh, they certainly had a few detonations to tell them maybe something was going going on is that yeah they will degrade over time and it becomes faster and faster so you're producing heat in the decomposition 
So they can be sitting on the shelf, not touching them, and they're producing heat. As I mentioned, that is one thing that will set them off. Whereas if you've got, say, the German explosives or most of the modern uh, military explosives, yeah, you can have a bit of heat, probably not even going to start a fire. But once you have a small fire, once you get a bit of heat in the right, the wrong spot, you're going to get a detonation. And the thing is, I that was not actually what I thought was going to be the initial cause. When I first looked into it, I thought it would actually be just because the acid is left over. My thoughts were, if you have any bit of dust, and I'm not talking about the mm. nitroglycerin dust from the, the cordite, just dust, a lot of dust, particularly in a ship like that, will be organic. So carbon-based, essentially, whether that's from just human shedding or whether it's actually from things like coal and bags and just anything made with a, a carbon base, a lot of those will react with sulfuric acid quite exothermically. And again, we're not talking on a macro scale. You only need the right amount of heat at the right point for a few molecules to cause a detonation. And so my thoughts was over time, that was what eventually was setting them off. It looks like it's probably even worse than that. And this is why that failure in manufacturing quality control came back to bite them. Turns out sulfuric acid causes that degradation to happen faster. In fact, one of the papers I was reading basically put the nitrocellulose in a sulfuric acid mix and within a couple of hours with gentle heating, it went boom in the, um, <laughs> it looks like they were using a round bottom flask and it blew all the caps off it. They actually had um, uh, basically slow motion imaging of it. And you can see that it just, it just detonates. So it looks like the leaving of the acid not only probably sped up the formation of the nitroglycerin dust, but it experimentally verified it also speeds up that decomposition so you have an exothermic decomposition you have sulfuric acid in there which is going to speed that up and also provide another avenue for causing heat yeah it's not a surprise that some of these things are going to go off on their own and it won't take much acid or much time before you get to the point where things are dangerous and i think that probably would explain the french who are basically using 100 percent no, yeah, you know, gun cotton in mm. its various stabilized forms, and in stabilized definitely in um, in quotes there, mm. uh, probably would also play a part with the cordite because again, the manufacturing is a bit different, but you still have that sulfuric acid and probably a bit of nitric acid left over too, and so I think that's it. Seems to be that it's the nature of these chemicals that that did them in unfortunately so one basically with pudra b once you start storing it effectively it's kind of like a very long long-term time bomb it's going to detonate at some point um it's just a question of have you used it up by that point or not well yeah and one of the things is that after uh, jutland because the british went through various uh, iterations of cordite this is a really useful explosive to them uh, one of the first things they did uh, from an industrial point of view after the battle was they went and they're like, okay, we actually do need to put quality control in there. And one of the things they did was they monitored each of the stages more closely and became a lot better at removing the acids from the final products. And you notice that after Jutland, even though they're still using cordite, you they don't seem to have that same problem. Yes, you don't actually have another major engagement that, would have been kind of a morbid curiosity to or you would be satisfying some morbid curiosity to see what would actually happen if you'd mm. get the same repeat uh, detonations if there had been a second major naval engagement but uh fortunately i think uh, for everyone involved there wasn't one yeah um just that actually raises a question in my mind with the pudra b degradation would that have been accelerated in warmer conditions yes uh it uh, heating is one of the things that speeds it up so that is also why the degradation speeds up over time because it's kind of a positive feedback loop mm. so if you're in warmer conditions yeah the degradation will happen faster the papers that i've looked at because there's there's two particular ones and i'll bring their names up in a moment uh, if anyone's curious to go read them they they seem to 
even the sulfuric acid one, I think they heated it, but definitely the other one that looked at the decomposition of nitrocellulose, uh, they, they, yeah, they did their decomposition by heat. That was how they, they mimicked a accelerated time schedule for it. They basically sped it up because, you know, you don't have months to sit there watching something in a lab. Most researchers uh, do actually have more to do with their time than that. So they, they used heat. So yeah, if you're under hotter conditions, you're under worse. The, I mean, the, the reason I ask is because I, I suddenly, uh, it sort of twigged in my head that when the French were suffering the, from these spontaneous detonations, a good chunk of them were happening in Toulon. And most of them overall were happening in Southern French ports. And the average temperature on the French Mediterranean coast is a bit higher than it is in the French Channel coast. And we're talking about pre-dreadnoughts and so forth. So they they have some refrigeration and cooling within their magazines, but not to the level that you'd see in, in later dreadnoughts. And to be honest, even in later dreadnoughts, um, even we can talk to this, like use an example as the, uh, the American Wyoming class, even at that point, they do have problems where ambient heat surrounding the magazine cannot be dealt with in some cases by... The cooling systems they have in place in in that case because they have a lot of the midships turrets it's partly the boiler rooms um just heating the magazines just enough to change the temperature of the explosive such that their middle turrets are shooting further <laughs> um than the fore and aft turrets which complicates salvo fire um but you know, step it back 10 15 20 years techn technology wise and then you have a you know a french brew dreadnought and it's sitting in the baking sun in in a mediterranean port then they all of a sudden makes a lot more sense why why a lot of the French magazine detonations are happening more often in their warmer ports than their their colder ones. So yeah, that was why when I actually found those papers, because they they're recent ones and they don't actually mention World War One or even beforehand at all. But it, it was interesting to see kind of combined conclusions from them to be like the acid speeds it up. The heat speeds it up, and over time, because of both of those, the actual decomposition will speed up. So, yeah, I'm I'm also curious as to if in peacetime, do you reckon they would have actually probably not been running the coolant systems they did have as much? Because you you may not have a fully manned ship under those cases. Mm. Well, a lot of the I think that it is a possibility because a lot of these. Um... A lot of these detonations are obviously happening in port. There's not, there's not a tremendous amount of, um, there's not a tremendous amount of explosions happening when ships are actually travelling at sea. They're not just you know spectacularly blowing up while they're en route to another port. It's happening whilst they're they're moored up. So yeah, I mean, given that you'd have lower numbers of crew, you wouldn't have as many boilers running. Therefore, you'd have less power. Um, you're also potentially sitting in dry dock, so you don't have the cooling effect of water around the hull. Um, at least uh, I think Iena, when she exploded, was in dry dock. Um, and yeah, and you, you're going to be running everything on a much lower, lower set, basically lower settings, if you like. Um, then yeah, in theory, the cooling systems might either have been running at a lower level, or possibly have been switched off, or possibly have failed. Um, I mean, again, it is fairly new technology at the time, so that that could also contribute to the to the heat, and and also obviously just generally over your overall ambient heat levels. If if your cooling system um, can say assure you that your temperature where the cooling system is operating will be 10 degrees lower than ambient. Well, if you're in Cherbourg, 10 degrees lower than ambient might be 10 or 5 degrees Celsius. But if you're in Toulon, it might be 20 or 25 degrees Celsius. Um, so your cooling systems could be running full whack and it would still be 10, 15 degrees warmer in there than it would be elsewhere. Um, and especially obviously when you're at sea, it tends to be a little bit cooler as well. Yeah, and... I think it's just kind of a combination of things that nitrocellulose, so gun cotton, just is not a really good chemical uh, in terms of uh, as a propellant. And I think that that, that actually would explain a lot that mm. they were in much warmer ports too. 
I'm now curious to see what would happen if the Germans had spent more time in warmer ports. I know they did have a few colonies, but I imagine on average each of their ships probably spent less. Because looking at one of the papers that I was mentioning, one of the ones I'm using for this one, um, does actually mention centralite. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'll have to have another close look because I I didn't notice that matched up with the German. Yeah, you've got German ports like Sing Tao, which is um in in the western pacific which are going to be quite warm but at the same time you know we're talking about we're talking about degradation in in terms of months or years realistically and the german ships that were assigned to that station they might be on station for a few years but then they'd be cycled back to germany whereas you know if you're part of the toulon fleet you're operating in two out of toulon and in the mediterranean for years or decades on end you might occasionally go up somewhere cooler but you're you're overall going to be you know you just spend far far longer in a in a mediterranean climate if you're part of the french toulon force than you will ever do if you're a, a german vessel because you, you, even the overseas colonial german vessels say they the the home ports are northern coast of germany which is somewhat cooler so they're going to be rotated back there eventually and the Brit- the British are obviously a bit all over the place. It's a, somewhat weird because obviously you've got the British ships generally operating, especially in the Mediterranean, in quite warm areas for a considerable period of time before the war. Um, but they are then obviously all in scapa flow for and British ports generally for the run up to and during World War One. But I suppose the caveat to that is, of course, that the we've got two different types of degradation. You've got the French of Poudre B degradation, which is going to be more sensitive to the ambient temperature, and then the cordite degradation that, as far as I understand it, is just it's just going to happen <laughs> with a nit- with a nitroglycerin powder. Uh, I think it would it'd be both. So the nitroglycerin and the actual crystals forming out from that one's a little harder to find information because again, looking up <laughs> the chemistry of explosives is yes. a, a bit of a uh, balancing act between mm. getting detail and not not getting yourself onto a watch list Mm -hmm. but the it looks like also is that um one thing i haven't mentioned yet is that nitric acid sitting around because you need both nitric and Mm -hmm. sulfuric acid sulfuric acid is particularly dangerous it's it's quite a it's a very hungry acid it likes to eat things and do it in a very uh, well very exothermic very heat generating manner but that nitrate uh nitric acid will actually nitrate some of the stabilizing agents so over time (laughs) the the acids if they're left there will start to pull apart the stuff that is stopping them from being unstable what i find a bit curious yeah a bit more curious with the cordite is that the changing the actual ratio of nitroglycerin to nitrocellulose is actually what uh what caused a lot of that dust though seems that one of the things they did in that and again i don't want to give the actual numbers but they did increase the ratio of gun cotton in the modified one which uh seemed to go off so i'm wondering if yeah it was actually a similar one going on uh but yeah it's it's a bit hard to tell because when they spontaneously detonate well anyone who would have been nearby enough to actually know what happened probably wouldn't be around after that uh, unfortunately yeah. they yeah and we also have to obviously remember that although they are capable of making these explosives and although there is an awful lot of science going into the manufacture of the guns the shells the charges the ships etc there are also certain things that i mean you'd expect them to know but they also occasionally seem to miss and later on it's easy in hindsight to go oh yes well obviously they should have done x but you know that at the time they made a mistake and then it, they just didn't realize if you don't realize you've made a mistake you're not going to go and correct it and particularly what i'm thinking about in terms of the the certainly the attitude in the royal navy to how safe cordite was with re- relation to what happens if it gets set on fire or there's flash or whatever um comes from an experiment they did during the early adoption of cordite and they were trying to work out is it safer or not than our previous explosives and someone very cleverly came up with the idea of well you can set fire to cordite sticks um and see what happens 
but then you know they realize well yeah but you can also set fire you can like you can have a handful of gunpowder in your hand and set fire to it and you probably will get away with it um it might sting a bit but um they don't answer, close their hand though yes yeah don't close your hand up uh, but they understood the concept that of scale it's like you have a massive pile of explosive it's going to react very differently to a very small amount and so they got a magazine's worth of cordite and stacked it all on top of each other as if it was in a magazine and set fire to it to see you know if you did that with a bunch of black powder you'd get a massive bang and they got a very very energetic burn but no explosion and from that they went right okay well clearly you know if we'd done this with black powder it would have blown a hole in the lawn we did it with cordite and we got a scorch mark therefore cordite is safer and less like much less likely to explode but anyone with a vague understanding of chemistry or material science is already probably slamming their head into their desk and going yes but you did put it in the confined metal box that is in the magazine yes one of one of the worst things you can do in terms of uh making explosives more dangerous is you can confine them because not only does that mean that that pressure wave or the shock wave has to go somewhere but also if you've got an explosive that is sensitive to pressure and you contain it it's going to speed the burning up and so when you that that's why i i've said so many times that once you get these fires starting when you're in the confined space of a magazine there yeah there is nothing you can do but yeah look at that but that was what it's a bit hard i think to blame some of the people in the the navy for it because they were told that it was safe i mentioned the mm-hmm. even the nine the 1899 paper on the production of nitroglycerin they all thought it was safe that was what they were being told their science was telling them no these are stable they'd added a stabilizing agent and if you'd taken a block fresh out of the factory at the time and you'd looked at it whether it was the mk1 the modified version or even the later ones and they put the better quality control in they would have for all intents and purposes appeared to be stable explosives they would have been fine the one of the things there they didn't have as you mentioned right at the beginning was the decades of experience they did not have that they hadn't had these accidents occur and unfortunately one of the fastest ways to learn things is from your mistakes mm-hmm. and if you look at you know gunpowder look how long it took them to even get cannons working the number of cannons that would um kill their owners rather than actually fire any projectiles at the enemy in the medieval period was just insane uh, yes part of that was also um their ability to work the metal and but even still there's a lot of things that go into it and some of these things with the the chemistry of it are things that we're as I said, the papers I'm referring to are recent. They're, they're using techniques or they're going back and having a look at these things with, with modern technology, modern understanding. And that's one thing is that science is a slow and boring process and doesn't always keep up with the military or what people are doing. It is, And I think also what, to go back to your point about, you know, you would expect them to know, unfortunately, science is very compartmentalized you it's too hard to be an expert in many things so whoever may have been the expert in the chemistry of the actual nitroglycerin Mm. or the cordite may not have necessarily had any engineering or manufacturing knowledge and they would have probably been very separate even modern science yes there's a lot of crossover but you can't become an expert in so many areas so it does take time for that information to kind of cross over and pass over each other so, and I think that was probably the the main culprit was, yeah, they didn't have the experience and the knowledge, even if it existed, didn't seem to be passed around. But it, from what I can read, it almost certainly they did not actually know, at least they didn't have any formal knowledge that this is what was going on. This is more of, yes, there's a few people figuring bits of it out, but in terms of the foot was realized on a grand scale, that, that did take a lot longer and was in hindsight of the uh, World War One. Yeah, and I mean, t- technically speaking, even even with that experiment, they weren't strictly wrong, because if you you know if you see a um, like the uh, the couple of photos that were taken of HMS Invincible while she's in the process of exploding, um, she's still physically intact. Some seconds into the um, explosion going on, there's huge columns of flame coming out of her amidships turrets. <laughs> 
but the ship is still structurally in one piece. And then as this burned ash explosion goes on, then she blows apart. Whereas if you see footage of large scale gunpowder explosions, um, like the test they did to replicate the gunpowder plot um, of uh, Guy Fawkes. Oh yes, I have seen this footage. Yeah, uh, it it's is like, definitely worth a look if if you haven't seen it. Yeah, but it's like if you set off black powder, for you to get a picture that would show a massive fireball over the thing which has just had the explosion, the thing that's had the explosion is going to be you know going in three hundred and sixty degree multiple directions, and will have been doing so for quite a while before that fireball gets up there. It's a, it's it would have been a much more instant destruction of the ship so it's like technically speaking yes cordite was still less volatile than black powder however it wasn't as much less volatile as they thought um so you the end result was the same it just took a few seconds longer oh and as i mentioned the when you have nitroglycerin powder which was not something that they were aware of or that any of the soldiers would have been told about mm. again you mentioned um hms lion yeah. I, they actually did they uh, noticed something was up to clean their act up a little bit yeah. but some of the others if if you're just a soldier who ha, who's not ex or you know who's not expected to know about all of these minute details or to them seemingly irrelevant details about the the cordite they're using that their, their job is to get the explosive in and and fire a shell at the enemy you can't expect them to know so you know, even if you've got this dust coming off, it's going to make it worse. But also, I think that when you actually get that kind of dust form of nitroglycerin, you're probably going to be much closer to that uh, uh, the gunpowder detonation than the cordite explosion mm. because it's powdered, it's more spread out, and the yeah. shockwave can basically pass through it a lot easier. And... Yes, I think, yeah, you would have, you are mentioning they have a bit more mm. of a burning time. One of the things I'm thinking of is it probably takes a, a bit of burning before it reaches the kind of pressures and temperatures mm. that cause it to detonate in all directions. I, I'm curious to the speed now of some of the explosions mm. on the British ships. Did they, mm. are there many other records of turrets going up first? Well, we unfortunately, we don't have any pictures of Defence Queen Mary or Indefatigable at the time of the explosion. It seems to have been a very, very lucky stroke of events that we have a couple of pictures of Invincible mid-detonation, mid as it were. Um, but we, from the accounts, you know, we do generally seem to see that either there is some kind of visible flame before it goes up, um, it's like people are like, oh, it's on fire, bang, oh, it's blown up. Or um, there is, even if there isn't a visible flame, there is a delay. Um, so it, I think in both Indefatigable and Queen Mary's cases, people see that the ship has been hit. And then it was like, okay, 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 bang. <laughs> um, there's, an indeter there's an indeterminate but distinct amount of time between the hit occurring and potentially start starting something and the the ship actually blowing itself to pieces but i think the other thing you mentioned about the, the fact that nitroglycerin is much more energetic um probably has a a significant bearing again on the whole you know what were the flash protections doing um at jutland because with them if the flash protections have been designed against the pressures generated by deflagrating or possibly exploding cordite if they're subjected instead to the effects of a fuel air detonation of nitroglycerin dust, that's probably a pressure that is far more intense than anything they were designed for, at which point it may not have mattered whether or not the flash protection was engaged. It would have just blown through it anyway. Um, that, that may also account for the delay too, is that actually that process took a while. And again, in the heat of battle, someone's recollections... Uh, you, you can't trust exact timing. So they might have thought it was a second or a few seconds. In reality, it was quite different. So I think, unfortunately, it's probably going to be quite difficult to to place it without mm. um, pictures or videos. But it, it kind of, yeah, it does bring up an interesting point of whether it was enough to actually cause some of the nitroglycerin dust to burn or detonate. And then that 
set fire to the cordite, but it still took time for the cordite then to actually detonate because mm. even if the cordite was still moderately more stable, it may, it again, it's a scale thing. It's not a, yes, it's perfectly stable. It's not going to burn. And it's a, mm. oh no, it's completely going to detonate. It, there might, there, there could, there's a, probably a bit of middle ground. And so the cordite is yeah. probably closer to the spontaneous detonation side than the other, but it's probably less to that side than gunpowder. Yeah. So, and if, and when you've got the magazines, I mean, these magazines have got hundreds upon hundreds of charges in them. So, you know, if, if one near the magazine door catches fire because of flash coming down the hoists, that doesn't instantaneously mean that every single other charge in that magazine is going to detonate, but that, that one catching fire burning possibly detonating if that sets off the half dozen around it and then they set off the four dozen around them it escalates very quickly but it, it's still a there's still a small time factor involved between the initial burn starting and the whole magazine going kaboom and, and that's why even though you know oh why i'm holding to what i said before even though i mentioned that you know once it catches fire there's nothing you can do. I will hold to that. Even if they, they don't spontaneously detonate immediately, once you do have a fire, the actual time that you would need to do something about it, you just don't have. No. Because again, yeah, okay, maybe you've got a second or two, but even the most switched on person is not going to be able to move a bunch of charges in a second. No. And I'm guessing that if you're not aware of it, you know, the average human reaction time, I least know in terms of driving is, is probably the, the closest I can think of is about a second and a half. Uh, it, I mean, it varies too. If this is a shock and you're not expecting it and you're, you've just had a shock wave come down. Uh, if you're still around or still conscious, you're probably not going to be in a position to do anything. So if they're an unlucky hit and the doors close, but it's not fully closed or you're in the process of moving these, if you've got cordite charges in the corridor, because you, carrying them along mm. i think there's just too many ways that it can unfortunately go wrong and if you have cordite go off in the hall that's going to also create another shock wave and again be all the, the dangers but i guess the bottom line is once that fire reaches the magazine uh, unlike some of the the other forms of explosives like the, the german one uh again i'm trying not to get too mm. much into the chemical yeah. names other than the um and that and also I have to keep scrolling back. But the, the centralite stabilized ones, they won't necessarily burn. Although the centralite also won't uh, doesn't seem to react as badly with the ni uh, with nitric acid. So even if they had a similar ma like failures in manufacturing, it's going to keep the German ones more stable. So you probably so you're not going to get the same one. And again. As you mentioned, that gave the Germans time to flood their magazine, whereas the British wouldn't have had that. Yeah, and I suppose this 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 is also the thing of, as you mentioned, it's the human factor. You know, could can you even put out a cordite fire with whatever water and sand you have to hand? Probably not. And as you say you know, you're probably have been knocked on. If you're lucky, you'll have been knocked unconscious by the shockwave coming down the ammunition hoists. And if you're unlucky, you're still conscious, but probably also on fire at which point you're going to be far more distressed about that than anything else in the split second that you've, you've got left. And I think this is one, another important thing to for people to bear in mind when it comes to chemistry. The difference, the fine line between deflagration and explosion is not seconds, it's fractions of a second. <laughs> um so whether whether or not something's happened with a very very intense fire that's built up pressure that's caused something to go pop or whether it's just literally an instant detonation that's caused something to go pop um it has important there are important differences between those two behaviors when it comes to applied chemistry or indeed actually you know propelling shells out of guns but when it comes to is this pile of several hundred tons of explosive going to blow your ship apart it doesn't actually make too much difference to whether or not you can do anything about it. Yeah. And I guess it's kind of just one of the unfortunate um, horrid side effects of war is that mm. yeah, things like this are going to happen. And this is certainly not the only case of 
you know, a lack of understanding of science getting in the way. But, you know, I people now are still studying some of these explosives. I Some of the people I've got to work with over the years, have, have, that's their area of expertise. We still don't fully understand it now. Back then, oh, it's, it's a very different thing. And, yeah, I think particularly in a confined space is the last place you want to be with an explosive that people have um, severely underestimated or overestimated its stability mm -hmm. at least yeah um that's it for this video thanks for watching if you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review let us know in the comments below don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions